it's, uh, it's great to be part of the Army's modernization strategy and the things that we need to do for our nation as we move forward. Uh, it's a unique opportunity, a unique time in our history. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today and the role that we have the opportunity to play as part of that future. Uh, and we talk about hypersonics and we talk about direct energy pieces of our portfolio, what we're going to focus, focus on today. And as, as was introduced, uh, Mr. Strider and Dr. Robin, both literally brilliant, brilliant people on both of these domains. And so we're lucky to have them. Uh, so I thought I'd just kind of refocus some of, the, some of the words that their secretary used today uh, in his message at the opening ceremony. Go, go to the next slide, please. The, the world we're in today isn't like the world we've been in for the last uh, almost two decades, right? We've been an army at war uh, across the global community, uh, and we've been fighting with our allied and partner nations in the global war on terror. And we've developed a series of tools and outcomes to be successful in that battle space. And our soldiers of all nations have done a wonderful job uh, in those uh, v VO uh, war fight. Today, our national military strategy has changed. And now it's the great power competition that you heard the Secretary talk about today. And, and as we've been off fighting the war on terror, the global war on terror, our adversaries have been modernizing. And you can see uh, some of the things that they're doing to, to modernize in, in terms of real expenditures. Right? If you want to modernize an army, it takes resources to do that. And so we've been applying our resources on the global war on terror, and now under the tutelage of our chief and our secretary, you have General Murray and Honorable Jetty in a partnership in the modernization of our army to, for the future fight. And we get to be a piece of that. So we focus on uh, lasers and hypersonics as our priority programs, and both of those are strategic outcomes. And then we have other things that we're working on that are, that are really not strategic, but critical technologies that we execute on behalf of our nation to bring a war fighting capability to our soldiers. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, this organization, some of you may not be familiar with this organization, specifically designed for a singular outcome. The, the purpose of the Rapid Capabilities and ca Critical Technologies Office is to move for stuff from the S&T community into prototypes at the unit of action level. That's why we exist. Take stuff that is done or near done and produce a prototype and give it to a combat unit so they can try it in the field. Uh, some in business would call that, if you're going to fail, fail fast and fail early. Don't make a programmer record. I'm not a programmer record guy. I've been a PEO. That's not my job today. My job is to take technologies and bridge them from the that brilliant group of S&T people into a prototype. And so that's what we do. And we do that across the, a, a wide domain of, of expertise and technologies. And again, today we're gonna focus on, on uh, hypersonics. Uh, we're lucky in th this command, uh, this organization, this director is, is headquartered at Redstone Arsenal in Alabama. That's where my flag sits. Uh, we have a group that sits at Fort Belvoir and we have a group that sits at Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And, and you can see that that's designed to span not only the laser and hypersonic technologies, which we, we kind of use and uh, develop out of Redstone. We do electronic stuff out of APG. We do weapon systems out of Fort Belvoir. And so there's a whole host of, of things that we do. We, we bridge between the S&T community, Cedric Wynn, General Wynn was just up here, the CCDCs, the, the S&T communities, uh, Ms. Christensen has a piece of that at Redstone, a great partner for us at Redstone. And we take that technology and develop it quickly into a war fighting capability. We're not trying to build an army's worth. We're trying to build a set of prototypes for a unit, normally at the platoon and battery, maybe the company level, to try it, to see if it works. And this organization is designed for three outcomes, right? Either we tried it and we liked it. Let's turn it over to a program executive officer uh, what, depending on what domain it is. We tried it and it, we didn't like it. Let's get rid of it. Let's don't make any more of these things. Or we tried it, we like it, but it's not quite ready yet. Let's put it back in the oven. Let's put it back to the S&T community and let them continue to mature that technology a little bit further. And so we have, we have application across uh, all of those domains. The other thing that we do is we try to reach out to industry uh, in a, this, this event we call Innovation Days. 
right? So we just recently had our first one where we invite, invite companies to come in that have unique technologies. Most of them are small companies, innovative companies, and we let them come in and present in a Shark Tank environment. Literally, we have a panel of experts across the Army from the Army Futures Command, from the S&T communities, from the PEOs, from the trade ox, uh, from the FCOEs or the COEs, Centers of Excellence, and we evaluate that technology. And if it's something we think we can use, then we very quickly award a contract. Um, it's really a great event because most of these companies know, have no idea how to work with the government. <laughs> and uh, they have some really innovative ideas uh, to move forward with. So we're very excited about that. So that's our purpose. That's why we live. That's why we exist, is, is to produce prototype outcomes uh, for, for our soldiers. What's unique about this is, in most cases, there's not a single company that can do this work. Uh, and it's not something that's been worked on in the last few days. You know, it, it, what most people don't know is that it's been being worked on since, like, 1980. But the technology's matured enough. We've proven it out. Um, how many people know what hypersonics means? So most, uh, yeah, most everybody I recognize is part of the contract team, too. That's good. But anything above Mach 5 is considered hypersonic speed. And so the physics and the science behind it is, is very interesting in that, you know, when you fly through the atmosphere at these kind of speeds, you've got a, a huge amount of heat you've got to deal with and manage. And so we've managed to, to conquer that hurdle and really prove to, uh, to put a system out there we know that will be capable uh, and, and will bring to bear what we need it to. So what is it we're bringing to bear? So we're going to field an experimental prototype with residual combat capability by 2023. Those words are tattooed on every one of us within the Rapid Capability and Critical Technology Office because we're not a 5000 series, we're not an 804 and 806. If we were, we wouldn't be able to get this done at the pace that we've got to do that. So General Thurgood has set up a structure for us to do this. And as you notice from the Octagon and also from the, from the big six in the Army that we report to, we could not ask for a, a, a higher leadership within the Army uh, that, that understand this and understand the importance of it. You'll see General McConville, you know, in the picture here in the middle, he is all behind this. Uh, Secretary McCarthy, all in with this. So we could not ask for better cover for this. What is it we're going to deliver? So by 2023, we're going to deliver a battery. <clears throat> it's going to have four launchers uh, based on an Army uh, tail, an Army trailer that's in inventory today. We've got to develop that tail. Each tail will have a two-pack on it, so our basic load and our first battery will be eight missiles. So that all-up round uh, that goes into that, onto that tail that's in the canister, and one of the key points to this is the Army and the Navy are in absolute commonality with this. So the booster that we'll use to launch it and the front end, the hypersonic glide body that's at the front end, will be absolutely common with the Navy. So there's a lot of economy of scale there. In fact, there's an MOA in place that put the Navy in charge of design and the Army in charge of production. So you'll also notice up here the Battery Operations Center, which is based on AFATID. So we're, again, we're taking known Army systems and we're using those as the baseline to, to field to. But we'll get this battery out here in 2023 and we'll prove this capability out. We've got a series of tests. We've been testing up to date with OSD as our sponsor. We've proven the technology. Now we want to get it out in the field by 2023. So we've got a, a pretty serious task. As General Thurgood mentioned, we've got all the contracts in place that we need to do. Sandia National Labs has been really the big brain behind this, but you know they're good at one ofs and, and good at the science and technology piece, but we've got to move it out of that, that realm into the production side with industry now. So there's a lot of challenges built into that, but we know we can get it done and we'll get a capability out there. So with that, I look forward to your questions uh, when they come up. I'll turn it over to Dr. Robin, and we'll talk about something just a little faster than hypersonics. All right, thanks, Bob. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So a year ago, I was here uh, and talking about, you heard a little bit on the video there, someone say MMHEL and the Unlimited Magazine. So I, I was talking about MMHEL and the plan to deliver a 50 kilowatt uh, a laser on a striker, TRL-7 demo in, in FY21, uh, along with PEO Missile Space and um, uh, uh, the CFT at that time. And I believe at that same AUSA, General Thurgood got the mission to be the director of the RICTO. So fast forward a few months in April, uh, General Thurgood gets a memo from the Secretary of the Army that says all of the directed energy 
efforts in the Army are going to fall under the Richto. I was fortunate enough to be sitting on an airplane next to General Thurgood uh, one, one night on the way back from uh, Washington, D.C. to Huntsville and uh, introduced myself, and, and, and I was fortunate enough to join that team. Uh, and, and the task at hand, the, you know, the direction from the Secretary was uh, uh, transition this technology accelerate it and get it to the warfighter as soon as possible. And, and that was the mission that General Thurgood uh, and, and I undertook. And it meant going out across industry, going out across uh, the other services and understanding what the landscape of that technology was and seeing where we could, we could pull it ahead. Uh, and I got three areas to talk about here. The one that used to be called MMHEL is called DEM Shore Ed now. Um, and, and so the reality is, is that we're not doing uh, anything much different than we had planned on doing. We're accelerating, and then we are investing more in the out years in order to develop that capability. So w where we were developing one 50 kilowatt laser on a striker and demoing TRL-7 in 21, what we have now is a competitive environment uh, through an OTA with Cord as our, our prime contractor. Northrop Grumman and Raytheon are competing for the laser, laser and beam control subsystems that will end in a demonstration at Fort Sill, the winner of which the Army will evaluate and has the op uh, opportunity to sell three more uh, laser weapon systems for a total of four that will field in a platoon no later than FY22. And as uh, Bob said, residual combat capability, same with directed energy, that's the goal there, to get this into the hands of the warfighter. So there's two other efforts here to talk about, right? One is uh, high energy laser indirect fire protection. So we had another effort called uh, high energy laser tactical vehicle demonstrator. That was a TRL-6 demo in FY22. So uh, again, we took that on us. We looked at what was out there in industry, what was in the government. What we found was the uh, Office of Secretary of Defense had a high energy laser scaling initiative where they were pushing laser power a little bit farther, a little bit higher, right? Giving us the ability to reach out a little bit farther to engage threats and, 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 and kill them a little bit faster, uh, more capability for the soldier, more capability for, for our Army. And so we took that on ourselves as a planning task in the out years to do that demonstration and then build four additional prototypes and field those in FY24. Uh, well, we also noticed, not looking within the Army, but when we went out and visited the Air Force, for example, uh, is you know lasers are great serial killers, right? They look at a thing. And, and speed of light, right? We talk about speed of light effects. The, the threat gets, or the, the, the effect gets there at the speed of light, but it takes a little bit of time to kill the thing that you're, that you're trying to kill. So high power microwaves is a different directed energy technology that engages more threats than one, right? And it's particularly uh, useful for, for counter UAS threats. Uh, so, so when we visited the Air Force Research Laboratory in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we found that they had spent a lot of money, a lot of time investing S&T dollars in high-power microwaves. There's no need for the Army to reinvent the wheel. Just like at OSD, there's no need for us to all be in, investing in the same effort. So we leverage those efforts, and, and, and there's a decision point out there in, in FY 22, 23 to field four high-power microwave systems for the Army, which we'll do uh, with residual combat capability no later than uh, FY 24 as well. Uh, so this quick rundown on what we're doing in directed energy. Uh, unlike hypersonics, who's obviously the number one strategic priority, we're number two, but we do have a, a, a host of efforts that we're working uh, and trying to push that technology out to the soldier. So with that, I think I'll end and look forward to your questions. Okay. All right, great, thanks. So you can see that it's uh, pretty exciting. Uh, when I had this job, I had a full, whole full head of hair, but hypersonics is so fast, it just wiped it right off my head. So uh, it's happening really quick, and uh, we're in a great place to have lots of support. Uh, I want to also introduce uh, two folks that are standing right back here. Raise your hand. So Marsha Holmes and Stan Darber are our deputies, or my, my deputies. Uh, Stan's here at Fort Belvoir, and Marsha Holmes is our deputy at Redstone. So uh, we're really glad to have them as part of our team. Uh, it was no kidding. When I, when I sat next to Dr. Robbins, I said, tomorrow you start working for me. <laughs> And uh, so he's been just a real blessing uh, to, to do that. We've been given some great, great authorities. And uh, you should get a sense from this conference, from this great event uh, sponsored by AUSA, that the Army is serious about modernization. If you didn't get that sense from the Secretary this morning, we are dead serious about modernizing our Army and creating the tools we need for the great power competition. The, way we, the reason we prototype early is, and, and we have a lot of soldier touch points in our plan, right? 
we bring soldiers in all the time to come and look at our screens and touch our equipment is, you know, because sometimes what an, a great engineer thinks will work, a soldier will actually tweak and make it work a little bit better. But it's not just soldier touch points. As you can see up here on this picture, uh, much to the chagrin of some of our engineers, we actually take them to the field with soldiers. So it's not just bringing soldiers to the labs, it's taking our engineers to the field with our soldiers. And so this happens to be uh, this summer at Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Petrini, the battalion commander, allowed us to come out to his unit uh, that was deployed in the field. We took our engineers out there and, and let them watch, uh, uh, in this case it had to be a Patriot and a THAAD unit, how they operate, what's the BOC do, how does the launcher work. And so that our engineers, as they're designing this, so quickly we, we can avoid mistakes in the lab that we then have to come back through the soldier touch point. So it's not just getting soldiers on the equipment, it's getting engineers to where the soldiers are so that the engineers can sense and feel and smell the battle space that this piece of equipment is gonna be, be working in. And so I'll pause right there uh, uh, and ask you two to come back up here and see if there's any questions that we can help anybody with. Yes. Wait, hold, hold on for a microphone or somebody will probably yell at me. Larry Wurzel, given the three technologies that you present, how effective would they be against an incoming hypersonic glide vehicle or hypersonic cruise missile? Yeah, so, so everything that Dr. Robin's on, working on is an offensive hypersonic weapon system. Uh, the missile defense agency where I came from prior to this job has a defensive mission. And so uh, Bob mentioned that the common hypersonic glide body is common on the Air Force Hacksaw program, the Army program, and the Navy program. It's also common with the defense program. So MDA, under a dear friend of mine, Vice Admiral Hill, has a responsibility for the defensive mission, and, and, and uh, we, we coordinate that across uh, at the OSD level with Mr. Mike White. There's actually a three-star board of directors under hypersonic specifically for that outcome. Uh, and the MOA that Bob talked about is, it governs that piece. Steve Trumbull with Aviation Week. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the impact if uh, the house mark on uh, LRHW goes through, and if, if that impact uh, is a one or two year delay, does that make you look at um, skipping a generation, going to op fires with a wing glider, more accuracy and longer range, um, you know, or what the options would be? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I don't know that it's more accurate. <laughs> it's a different shape, and it flies a little different, doesn't have the same amount of range. So the outfires program is designed for an outcome, and these systems are designed for an outcome. Um, at, the end, at the end of the day, the modernization program, the secretary and the chief want us to execute has to be resourced by Congress, right? W what we do is gu guided by their resources. So we present those resource applications to Congress, and then Congress has to determine if they're gonna resource that through the appropriations. If they don't, then we have to relook the course of action and the strategy. And so I can't tell you today, if, if I get 50 million less here, what does that mean, right? What we do is we start turning knobs and dials and, and try to produce as much as the outcome we can on the timeline we need it. Right, right now in hypersonics, whether it's, uh, whether it's this, the conventional prompt strike program at OSD, which is the land component, Navy, sea component, or it's DARPA doing some DARPA work, there's lots of support for hypersonics, but we'll see how that plays out, uh, what Congress decides to do. Um, and so, so we'll play our role as the services, present what we believe are the requirements to Congress, and then they have to apply that back to us. Once we get that answer, then we'll, we'll either stay on the path we're on or adjust the path we're on. Uh, we think we're in a good place right now. Uh, clearly the money we need to do this is, is you know, this is not an inexpensive business, to, and, and making prototypes is hard, hard, hard work, so. Uh, good afternoon, Jason Sherman from Inside Defense. Bob, I wonder if you could tell us about, uh, describe the program going forward. What are the, the, the key milestones uh, that your office has to oversee between now and delivering that first battery of LRHW? So you say in the striker program? Uh, no, the hypersonic weapon program. So, so where are we going with that? What are the key milestones between now and so the key milestones right now are just, we, we understand the technology, we know what we're gonna produce, uh, we wanna make it better as we go, uh, but you know, for the path we're on right now, the key milestone will be fielding in 23. And we've got to get, make sure that we've got the resources available to be able to meet that date. 
Uh, so, you know, a key milestone. The key things are, yeah, the key effects will be like the, the tail I mentioned. We have to do that design and development, which is not going to be very hard. It, we know how to erect missiles. You know, it's a matter of putting on an existing Army trailer that we already have in inventory. We've got a heavy mover that we'll move it around with. We, the canister development that's got to be done. Uh, the Navy is taking a little different launch approach than the Army, so the canister will be a little different from that, but the all-up round itself, the booster and the, the glide body that will be the front end will be exactly the same. So that canister development has got to be done, and then it's got to be integrated onto the, uh, onto the tail itself. But also the command and control piece of this, you know, that will be based on an Army system, AFA TIDs, you know, we've got to get those hooks all built into that so that message is coming down from a very high echelon for this type weapon system will be put in place to receive that, process it, and upload it into the missile so it'll do as designed. So right now we're planning for six. Uh, so we're, we've got a pretty aggressive flight schedule. In the past, we've done a test every two, two and a half years. Uh, just because that was the pace of, of maturing the technology. But we've got a, an aggressive test schedule that will actually take this to prove out what we want to field, and then we'll actually hand it over to the soldiers that will field it uh, for at least two events so that they will actually go all the way from deployment all the way through uh, setting up, receiving the message, and going through the launch sequence and, and hitting and impacting the target you're aiming at. Are the flight tests in the Pacific, or, or where did those So place? there's some questions still on that. Uh, a lot of our testing, all of our testing before has been in the Pacific theater. Uh, so we, we, we have a known uh, test structure there. And the testing, you know, because of monitoring for the flights, the range safety that has to be done, we, that's a well-known asset that we, we take full advantage of. Uh, so we will look at other ranges as we go. Uh, I know the Navy's looking at some East Coast capability. We'll be looking across the board to see what makes the most sense for the scenario that we're trying to exercise. And are you dual-hatted? You're acting as an executive agent for the other services and some on, on the glide body, glide body part of the program. And then uh, can you describe a little bit about uh, how, how, you, how you work the, that division of labor? In so, yeah, so the glide body piece, so as we mentioned before, there's an MOA in place. Uh, where the Navy has design responsibility, the Army has production responsibility. So we're working extremely closely with the Navy on this, on this uh, production, on this design capability and then how we produce it. We've got our industry partners on board now. Uh, no secret, Dynetics is, uh, it was the, that won the OTA for the production side of that. They've got a team built around them now that they're starting to spin up. They're at Sandia right now learning all the processes and procedures to build this very unique system. So. Our piece of this, and we were, you know, like I said, with the Army and Navy, we're very close. With the Air Force on their hacksaw program, they're about 70% uh, common with everything that we're doing. So that commonality is really going to help put a lot of uh, uh, confidence in that design and capability. We know it works. You know, op fires got mentioned earlier. You know, the the thing with op fires is it, they're, you know, they've still yet to shoot a test. So what I'm looking for from an engineering perspective and from S&T is, you know, once these things mature and they come up, what scenario do they best fit? Because they do bring different, a uh, little bit different capability. And there are other scenarios that they may be a better fit for that our leadership will, you know, uh, see what, what the best fit for that weapon system is. Okay. Hello. Um, while testing the offensive side of hypersonics, uh, Will there be any opportunities performed for data collections during those testings that might actually inform the counter side, although they're separate, but they might help? Yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's a good question. All, all of the testing that we're doing, one of the things this MOA does that Bob talked about is everything is shared with all the services, right? There is no, there is no well, this is Army data and you can't have it, or this is Navy data, you can't have it. So the three stars have all gotten together and go, look, everything you're doing, if you're doing a test, we're not going to duplicate it. And if, you're, if we're doing one, you don't duplicate it. Everybody gets 100% of the data, right, right? So we can maximize every shot, every test, ground test, flight test, every shot. All the data goes to, to everybody, offense and defense. OK, listen, uh, let, let me just close with uh, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, so first of all, 
uh, we really appreciate the great work that has come out of the S&T community, which has set the conditions for all of this to happen, right? To move forward with rapid prototyping to a unit of action level. In this case, it has to be a battery or a platoon level if it's directed energy. It is time for us in our modernization strategy and support of the Secretary and the Chief and our Army and our nation uh, to move forward as rapidly as we can. To industry's credit, they have, they have put a lot of, of intellectual and resources into this outcome. Uh, and they've come together in a collaborative manner. We have a, in hypersonics, we have a common set of metrics across six companies. I mean, think about how unusual that is. Uh, six companies come together, share their data with each other about are they on schedule, off schedule, what, what is their role, are they, so we don't get to the point in three years where we go, oh, we thought you were doing that. When, you know, that would be a negative outcome in my world. And so uh, to industry's credit, uh, when you're out talking to them about it, they've really, really done well. Um, we're relying on Congress to resource the outcome that the Army wants, and, and with whatever resources they're provided, we'll move forward with that. At the end of the day, the reason we exist in this domain and this mission set is to provide equipment to our soldiers to win on the battle space. Look, soldiers do two things really good, right? We win wars and we break things. <laughs> That's what we do. We need great material people in the S&T world, great industry partners to make equipment to give to our soldiers to be successful on the battle space. And so that's why we exist to provide them that early look at the technology to see if it is what we want it to be, to see if it produces the outcome on the battle space we want it to produce. And if it is, then we transfer that to a program of record and a PEO structure for them to be successful. So thanks for what you're doing here today. Thanks for your interest in what we're doing across these domains. And uh, God bless you for what you're doing and bless our soldiers who are out there doing really hard jobs. Thanks.